It's Comics Great. It's the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, beautiful, uh, sublime Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aedl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, the comics we love, the lifestyle of a cartoonist, all the thoughts and fears and dreams that go into this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, returning to the show, I'm so glad to have him back, Tony Cliff. Of Deliladirk.com. Hey, Tony. Uh, top of the morning to you. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, How do we feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's the beginning of the afternoon here, but you are on the West Coast, so it is early in the morning. That is true. That is true. I, oof, my limited worldview. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's like that in every time zone. You know, I, mean, I, I have to remind myself to post Eastern time when I post the times and when the show is going to air. Um, because, of course, everybody just knows that 1230 means 1230 my time. Uh, but yes, guys, we just put it, we just put the call out there on Twitter. Everybody, stop what you're doing. <laughs> Drop. Um, let God, we're gonna talk about some comics. Tell your friends. Yes, come sit down, join us. So Delilah Dirk comes out at the time of this recording. This recording is happening what August twenty first, twenty thirteen. Uh, so next week. Uh, in exactly one week, I believe, on the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. So yeah, seventh is the release date. So not much longer to wait, but you can pre-order it now. I mean, for the folks who are watching live, you can pre-order it now. Uh, the information is where it's on the first second website, right? Um, there is definitely information on my Tumblr. Oh, which is TonyCliff.tumblr.com. Uh, you know what? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can search for Tony Cliff Tumblr or go to Deliladirk.com. Let me just look, copy link location. All right, paste, boom. Now you have it. Oh, okay. So, uh, del- oh, there it is in in the chat. TonyCliff.tumblr.com. Sweet. <laughs> uh, that's where you can find out about pre-ordering it. But if you don't want to pre-order August twenty seventh, or if you're listening to this after the fact, it's in stores now, and you can go to your local bookstore, comic book store, and pick up a copy of this book. And I highly, highly recommend that you do because oh, it's look like at that. that. Advanced reader copy. Look at that fancy foil lettering. Is that uh, Colleen who did the design for the, the book cover? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I believe that was her idea. Ah. So I have her to thank for that. So Delilah Dirk, for those who are new to the show and just discovering this and saying, like, Tony Cliff, who? Uh, nobody, nobody should say that. But for that one person, that one person uh, in Greenland who's watching, uh, what, is, what is Delilah Dirk? Well, let me tell you, because I definitely know the answer <laughs> to that excellent question. Um, Delilah Dirk is sort of a uh, swashbuckling adventure tale set in early 1800s Turkey. Um, it's a sort of a story about how she uh, meets a lieutenant in the uh, Turkish army, in the Janissary army. Um, thus the title, the Turkish lieutenant. Um, and his sort of introduction to the adventuring lifestyle. And he, through, uh, he becomes a victim of circumstance. And in just trying to do his job. Yes, yes, yes. She swings into his life and, and he is swept up. Everything off kilter. And it's, it's and, a lovely hook for a story because you're starting with a guy who is really kind of wound tightly, has. Well, yeah. He, he's, a little unfortunate. <laughs> a little unfortunate in his lot in life, and uh, and he has no choice but to go along with her. Uh, it's it's go with Delilah or die, and going with Delilah almost means that you're going to die too. Sort of, sort of. He does have a choice, but uh, but um, well, I'll leave it to the readers to discover it for themselves. They can actually uh, check it out online. Um, the first two chapters, um, it's it's still up there. So, so you check it out. Take a look for yourself, uh, and and then um, yeah. Suffice it's to say, story in the book. It's it's a beautiful adventure story, and I think yeah, I mean Delilah is, in my opinion, on par with heroes like Indiana Jones, like that kind of a classic, you know, swashbuckling hero. And uh, it's a beautiful book, wonderfully told, and everybody should buy it. But we got to talk about the cat comic. We got to. <laughs> 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 the cat comic, yes. Uh, Delilah Dirk and the Easy Mark, which is another free comic people can read on Tor.com. Mm-hmm, this is true. Uh, yes. So, uh, 
<laughs> returning viewers or listeners um, will have seen Callista's excellent uh, interview, inter podcast that she did with you. What Correct. Was that? Yeah. Um, so you and Callista Bro. Uh, Callista is the editor at First Second, with whom I worked on the, uh, the Turkish Lieutenant. Um, in the process of describing her duties as an editor, made, I believe, an offhand comment about saying something. She said something along the lines of, oh, I, I would never have asked Tony to take her, his main character and, and turn Delilah into a cat. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> there are in-between steps. There, there's, uh, there's intermediate goings on. But uh, I made an 11-page <laughs> short comic uh, about that. It was episode 75, Comics Are Great 75, Editing Graphic Novels with Callista Brill, which was a really, she had so much useful information for anybody who's interested in getting into the, the traditional publishing world of comics. Um, and that's at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG75. But yeah, she started out by saying like uh, two things that she automatically gives a yes to are, I think she said skeletons and cats. And then it was followed by, I would never, <laughs> but at the same time, I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, like you got to make your heroine a cat. But you took the challenge. Sure, and, absolutely. And, and it's a great story. It was so, so <laughs> lovely. <laughs> and Delilah is adorable as a cat. Uh, but that's at Torah.com. And uh, it, was, it was funny. While you were working on it, you were posting teaser images online. And I, I was at the American Library Association conference. And you were, you were very uh, sweetly pointing me at them by at tweeting, you know, including an <laughs> at tweet to me. Like, check it out. I'm doing more cat uh, paddles. And so it's our in joke. <laughs> that's basically what it was. And, but like the, all these librarians who were watching both of our feeds <laughs> thought I was somehow in on this thing. Like I was like you were I don't know what they thought, but they were like, so what's what's going on with the cat comic? Is that really happening? What's going on? I don't know. I just see panels. But a lot of people were excited about it. So I hope it got some traction. But uh, but we're going to talk about character design today. That that was the, 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 the one little piece that I don't think we've discussed together about your work and the work in Delilah Dirk. Um, and then maybe we, if we have time, we can fit in talking about the importance of being important. Because that was another thing I found on your Tumblr recently that I really enjoyed. But, but when I'm looking at the characters, so I did a fan art for Delilah Dirk, what, a year ago? Maybe more than that. And uh, it, was a, it was really interesting to, I mean, it's always interesting to take somebody else's characters and try to put your spin on them or just try to do them justice. And but what it what it does, what I like about doing that is it, it's a chance to investigate a character and investigate somebody else's character design choices. And the first thing I noticed as I was trying to sketch out the character was everything on Delilah is seems like it's there to accentuate movement. Like everything is there to be dragged or pulled or flown around. Like her hair, she's got like this this long, huge uh, bundle of hair. That is restrained, but not enough so that and there Tony's putting it up on the screen. If Matt can pull it up, uh, it's this huge like oh that well on his Skype hair on his Skype screen. Uh, <laughs> it's got, can you put it back up, Tony? Because we just cut to that. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, she's got this this but this long hair that's bundled up with all of these like it's it's constrained but not constrained. It flows around this long flowing skirt that's just flopping all over the place. This belt, her weapons belt is very loose and hangs off the waist so as to be like pulled in every direction when she's moving. Even her boots are loose in a way to accentuate the movement. So I'm looking at this and I'm going, this has to be intentional because then I look at the book. In the last time you were on, we were talking about action and capturing action in your comic stories. Man, all that is there to say, look at how much this woman is moving around. And then you look at Salim, on the other hand, not as much flowing stuff. Much more restrained in his design. His, his head is covered, the oh. neatly trimmed beard. Right? Uh, you are reading something into there that uh, I did not intend. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to use it. <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 this is one of those things, Tony, where I think that a lot of the stuff is happening in the back of the head when we're working. And we don't know we're doing it until we look at it after the fact. But then when you when somebody points out or when you catch it, it's like, oh, well, of course, that makes perfect sense why I would do that. Um, so I'm, t I'm talking to Guy Fu. Whether or not he is aware of it, he's doing really clever and brilliant character design. So I'd like to walk through this, like like what your process is of coming up with the character design. Like, how did Delilah Dirk start? How did, like, did it start with a doodle? Did it start with, I want to do a swashbuckling story? Did it start with, I like long hair? 
where, where, where did it begin uh, when you start sketching out these characters? Um, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to say a lot of that might have been um, might have been a reaction to <sighs> when you see like when you see a female character in a comic book. What is it? Like nine times out of ten, it's always a skin tight bodysuit. Mm-hmm. So some of it, some of it comes from that. And admittedly, I mean, you know, she's still rocking around in some tight fitting stuff. But the other reason, the other and the other technical reason for um, some of the stuff she's wearing is that, like, she's got um, uh, what do you call them? bands around her upper arms and. Um, at least uh, early on in the story, has bands around her forearms to help sell foreshortening, oh. because the uh, the concentric circles um, make it a lot make the foreshortening a lot easier to read. If you know if if an arm is pointed directly at the camera, if you've got those rings around the arm, yeah, uh, that helps that to read. So that's a mechanical choice. That's like an aesthetic mechanical choice you're making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Because um. I, well, the, the reason I phrased the question thusly is in episode 77 when you were on, mm -hmm. you talked about that sometimes ideas for action sequences begin with, it'd be cool to have a fight on an aqueduct. And that's sure. the beginning. And, and, and man, I was just talking with Eric Orchard, Inky Bat on the Twitters. Uh, about how you know he was uh, highlighting that he just had a conversation with an editor about how a lot of artists will make like writer artists will make storytelling choices based on an aesthetic decision. This would be fun or cool to draw, or I'm not going to do that because I don't like drawing that. To which I threw in, it's like, well, that can get in the way of a narrative, but it's also a perfectly valid decision because it's a visual medium after all, right? So can right. so does it start with? Does it, let me, does it start with like drawing something that you think is cool? Does it start with a personality idea, a character role, or or a name even? Like Dan Mishkin once told me that a lot of his stories begin with the title. He comes up with an interesting title and then builds the story out of that. Now, see, that is a smart idea because coming up with titles has got to be one of the hardest <laughs> things to do. Oh, titles are just the worst. So if you start with a title and then you go from there, you've automatically saved yourself hours of hard work. <laughs> well, Delilah so. Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant was hard to come up with? Um, definitely, yes. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, but, like, looking at her, her character design and stuff, I think a lot of it came from, from the historical research. Uh, she's got this big swishy pleated skirt, which is supposed to tie into, um, it does two things, actually. It's, it was, at the time when I designed her, there were, there were swishy pleated skirts that were really in fashion, but it's also supposed to be reminiscent of Greek. Um, uh, ooh, somebody pointed out the, actual, the correct name to me at some point. Um, uh, but the Greek army, I believe, used to wear these dense pleated skirts. The men did. Okay. Um, and it's supposed to all tie that together a little bit. Um, so but, part uh, of these decisions sorry. come out of also the research that you do on the character as well. Yeah, and uh, Salim's design. Um, he's up here in the uh, right there. <laughs> Upside down. Maybe, maybe there we go. more helpful <laughs> if I just sort of... Uh, his design is all um, uh, more or less constrained by the historical requirements. Um, of course. But cold, even then, cold. even then, when you're doing your research, I bet you're coming up with a lot of different options for what he could be wearing, right? Ye yes and no. I um, uh, <laughs> actually just wrote a wrote a bit of an article about this, um, about sort of historical accuracy and how much you want to stick to it. Yeah. Um, some of my thinking with that was, okay, the more the more crazy stuff you want to get away with elsewhere, the, uh, the more it pays to make other parts more accurate. Mm. So you take you know, some details and make them very accurate. And admittedly, um, my level of research has increased <laughs> as I've gone along creating the story. So it's not all 100% not all accurate. Um, 
but you make some de some parts some details really accurate then you can do some really crazy stuff on the other side like say a flying boat right That's yeah which does show up in the story uh yes. interesting so it's also part of the decision making process is coming up is measuring that suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Like it, it, anticipating it and measuring it and balancing that for the audience as well. Um, yeah. Because somebody's going to say to me, uh, well, that's all well and good, but Tony's writing a historical fiction kind of dealy do. I'm doing straight up fantasy, so I don't need to do research. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, even then, I think it can help to go get that historical research or get some, some things that you'll be inspired by and pull in. Um, elements, and you can see this in the Star Wars art books. Yeah. Um, when the pro uh, those three the three episodes came out, the three prologues came out, they released art books with them, and they're say what you will about the movies, the art books are pretty good. They're they're quite good books, um, and you see a lot of them pulling from different cultures and and you know pulling different touchstones so instead of coming up with something that's completely foreign you've got like little touchstones of recognizability in there um that people can relate to so it doesn't so you still get that that high fantasy feeling of it but mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily come from a completely foreign place uh, uh Eric, Eric Kloster in the chat the guy who manages our chat uh thank you Eric I uh, found uh the Greek skirt, is it the Fustanella? Is that what somebody called it? It might be. It okay. might be. Well, we'll link to it in the show notes if that's the right one. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so like doing, doing research can create, creating those touchstones. Like this goes back to that idea about like the, the young person who says, like, I want to create a completely original idea. And then to which I say to that young student, uh, if you do that, good luck selling it to anybody because it's completely outside of human experience if it's truly original. Like it has to have some kind of. <laughs> Uh, it has to have some kind of like grounding in people's common experiences to make it relatable. And mm -hmm. so you borrow. And so even if you are doing a fantasy story, doing some research of uh, can not only give you uh, insights to come up with character design ideas, but also um, suspension of disbelief. I think that's fantastic. Um, there was um, sort of tangentially related to that. Oh, geez. Um... <laughs> What's what's the name of the gentleman who died yesterday? The writer. Oh, help us out, chat room. Uh, the the mystery writer. It was Elmore Leonard. No. Yes, thank what? you, Elmore yeah. Leonard. One of his. Um, uh, so New York Times or somebody linked to his New York Times article of ten things not to do, ten, like advice to writers, ten things, and one of them was, uh, and this is interesting, one of them was don't start with the weather. Don't describe the weather <laughs> unless you're Margaret Atwood and you can paint a, a picture with words. Don't start with the weather because people are just going to be – people are going to come into your book and they're going to be looking for the first human they can find. Uh. So going back to your idea of creating something entirely original, um, if we take that idea about not writing about the weather – you know, maybe we can tie that in there together. People are going to be coming into your book and looking for something they can relate to, or looking for their angle into the book. Mm -hmm. So, so going back to character design, though, and this idea of making somebody um, relatable, uh, but also like the the visual decisions that you make. I also, and maybe this is me reading into things. Uh, this is your opportunity, Tony, to say I totally intended this. <laughs> I noticed that even in the body language between Delilah. And Salim, that her like when she's sitting in that jail cell, that first time you see her in that lovely panel where it's all like with the lighting that just cuts right down the middle of the panel, framing her. Uh, but enough light in the background to see that it's a dank cell, but you know it's not too dark. Uh, her body language is all very like when she's not doing awesome action, she's like a ragdoll slump, mm. right? Like very loose in her poses and very open and and just uh, almost careless. Whereas Salim is always. You know, very tightly pulled in. Um, when you're working out your character designs, are you working out like signature poses too? Um, well, or is this just happening uh, like intuitively? So down in San Diego, somebody was saying something very interesting, and I I, I apologize, I can't remember um, this gentleman's name. It might have. Uh, I'm not even going to try to attribute it because I I will just end up naming the wrong person. Um, was saying. When he's doing character designs, he likes to do, instead of doing a character design just by itself, 
Um, he will do a an illustration with a character interacting with another character because that'll tell you so much more about each of those characters um, because they're interacting than it will if you were just to draw a you know a front three quarter view and go from and there's a place for that of course yeah. you know you got to sketch it out you got to work that stuff out mm-hmm. costume details whatever yeah. um, but I really like that idea uh, and then it occurred to me it occurred to me when you mentioned that. Um, the very first drawing I think I have of uh, these two characters of mine, Salim and Dalala, is them is Salim. Uh, it's it's similar to what happens in the first chapter. There's Salim uptight and and trying to narrate um, things she's telling as she's leaned back in a chair, gesturing and 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 talking about all these these crazy stories that he can't possibly believe. Um, <laughs> So yes, yeah, some of that some of that idea does come in at the beginning there, and a lot of it I think is just sort of uh, trying to trying to to illustrate a character's personality as best you can. Sure. Um, so it is intentional, whether it's conscious, I'm not sure. If somebody were to be conscious of it, then they would definitely be ahead of the game. Uh, it, it's something I like to think about when I'm working with my students is when, you know, I, I try to break down comics into shape, size, line, and color for them. Here's the four mm-hmm. major realms of concern for you to approach this design with when you're building a character. And invariably, they do the senior picture, right? The, the I'm just standing next to a thing kind of pose. <laughs> and like, well, I've got the shape, size, line, and color. Like, well, now you got to give it life. Now you got to give it context. Now you got to, like, make this thing, show me how this thing is different than anything else, not just in the way it looks, but in the way it acts. Uh, and, I mean, it, it's it's all there in the in Delilah Dirk when you look at it. So I didn't know if that was happening, if that happens at the sketch phase when you're working out the characters or if it's when you get to the thumbnails that you really start to make sense out of that. Yeah, I mean the first the first drawings I have, uh, and I <laughs> they they spring to mind pretty readily because I I kept them, and we're doing an art show right now that involves a lot of uh, the process work behind all this stuff myself and Rebecca Dart and Simon Roy and Brandon Graham. We all got this show where we show you all our uh, our dirty laundry, the sketches that go into it, and <laughs> that sort of thing. That's at a local gallery here in Vancouver. Uh, oh. But yeah, so as part of that, I found these early drawings, and I have those the the costume sketches and this and that and the other thing. And um, but again, yeah, yeah, those drawings of characters interacting mm-hmm. and stuff, and and showing off their personality. And um, Jersey, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just elaborated on on the point that I made, so I appreciate that. I- did I? Uh, yes, you did. You're a natural. Uh, okay, so now talk about biography. Um, one of the things that we discussed on episode 79 of the Comics Are Great Show with Dean Tripp and Dan Mishkin that I thought was really a nice telling and revealing thing was they said that one of the most uncomfortable moments of writing a story is when they realize how much they're writing about themselves and their worldview and their own experiences are getting filtered through these characters. Now, obviously, you did not live in the 19th century. Uh, <laughs> or did I? Who knows? Uh, uh, but, I mean, so... Something I'm curious about is like where character ideas come from in terms of your biography. I mean, obviously, when you say a swashbuckler, I'm guessing you don't know many swashbucklers personally. And I'm not asking you to name like who characters are based on or any kind of like salacious stuff. What I'm curious about is do you, how do your personal interactions and the characters you meet in life, how do they trickle down into the characters that you write? Is it something where it's whole cloth? Because I've done this where I'm like, Remember that gal that we used to work with? She was a real nut. I'm putting her in this comic, but now she's going to be a frog. <laughs> you know, uh, but sometimes it's it's also like, oh, you remember that really terrible person I used to date? She had a terrible worldview. I'm going to take that worldview and put it on this world conqueror character that I'm writing. Uh, how does that work for you? Um, so, so you're talking sort of about the, the write what you know idea, yeah. right? Sure. Um <clears throat> And I'm just looking at my book off screen here, trying to sort of pull <laughs> memories and ideas from it. <clears throat> we should say that you wrote this book. You worked on this book a while ago. I mean, yeah, it takes a long yeah. time for a book to come out. Um, so It does take a long time for a book to come out, and the book had been entirely completed before then. Yeah. <clears throat> and it had been about five years' worth of work. Um, not steady, just sort of 
working on a chunk, break, work on a chunk, break, that sort of thing. Um, I do get those points in there, um, and I and I wouldn't call it biography, but I do get those points in there. Where I'm like, oh, that's uh, you know, that's something I would say, or oh, that's something a friend would say, or, and I get that feeling like, oh, some of these characters' behaviors are some of my behaviors, or some and and some of this other character's behaviors are some of my other behaviors. <clears throat> um. But then I get people like, say, my girlfriend in the other room who comes in and says, hey, this character is based directly off me. Yeah. <laughs> I say, wow, did I do that intentionally? Hmm. Well, and, and as Dan Michigan pointed out in the episode I was just referring to, he said, like, sometimes it takes somebody else coming in and revealing that to you. You know, they're looking at your manuscript going, this is really just about your eighth grade camping trip, isn't it? You know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then yeah, he, and it all comes from somewhere. I mean, you got to... Um, like you were talking about earlier, inventing something whole cloth, it's you can't even try to do it, basically. Yeah. You're pulling from something. Um, how, it's just a question of how obviously you're pulling from you know, your own experience or how directly you relate to your own experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was going to... And you, men- you, know, you mentioned 1800s and Turkey. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think that's. I think that might just be a really. Sorry, let's see if I can see if I can phrase it in a constructive way. Yeah, it's it's chronologically and it's spatially really separated. Um, but I don't think that's as big a deal as it superficially seems. Um, I've been I've been working on the script for a second book, and to do that, I've been researching a lot of Austin, which uh, Jane Austen, which has been difficult. Um, but after I was, after I, you know, struggled my way through and got into it, um, it's surprising how, uh, modern some of the sentiments in it feel. Mm -hmm. These, these characters do not, the way she writes about it, once you make, once you get through the impenetrable barrier of the difference in the quality of the English, um, once you get through that, the it 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 seems very current, which I think is probably why they keep it keeps getting brought back and it keeps getting readapted. Oh yeah, uh, the ideas in there are all basically the the same as as um, you know people of the same age and and situation would be going through these days, which is which I found surprising when I started to flip through these books and discover that. So yeah. Um, I don't know. I think they're just some experiences and some, you know, those like natural clashes of, of character and and personality types that are just gonna keep being relatable to people. Well, yeah, relatability is the number one thing, right? Uh, finding out um, what what's is is uh, Jane are Jane Austen's novels about a girl in the English countryside court going a court and we're finding the right guy to go a court and with or is it about um the problems of of class warfare and an intrigue and people uh settling for less versus following their dreams the tensions that come in there um so yeah it's, it's really distilling it down to what's what's the essence of the idea of the thing yeah, and it is. It is about all those big things in it, but it also works down to like a really small level just on character to character interactions and personality right. types and stuff. Just like really, really small details. Yes, the language is different, but uh-huh. the sentiment there is you know, the same as basically high school kids these days. <laughs> Mr. Bingley is a high school kid. That's going into the tease for this episode. Uh no, you're talking to a guy who actually enjoys Jane Austen stories. Uh but let's they're go. really good, right? I, I think so. I think they're yeah. incredibly compelling, and I can watch the <laughs> masterpiece theater versions, and I can watch the the new ones with um, Anne Hathaway and whoever. You know, they they all work for some strange reason. I think it's because she got to that essence, and her characters have a relatable essence. Um, let's talk about research real quick because you've mm-hmm. been hitting that back and forth a little bit. I want to know how you go about doing research. You're talking about actually, like, I'm going to write a story that takes place in this period when these Jane Austen books are written. I'm going to read Jane Austen then, you know, um, that to a lot of young cartoonists that I work with sounds like a lot of work when you should just be drawing the darn thing. 
Uh, it is a lot of work. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the, there's definitely a mindset you can get into, and, and I've got into it, where I think to myself, okay, I can only begin this project or I can only get past this one part of this project once I have, once I've accumulated enough, once I have leveled up my research high enough, yeah. uh, then I can, then I can take on this, this, the boss in my project, <laughs> um, but I'm going to need more potions. <laughs> um, but for me, my research process for better or for worse, again, uh, several, uh, perfectly wonderful readers have kindly emailed me and politely informed me that the teacups are all wrong <laughs> in, in the Turkish lieutenant. Fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, my research process has been more or less continual, just steady, 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 steady. I'll work on some stuff. I'll make some pages. Uh, keep going. Keep pushing forward. Um, and then just in the background, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's, you know, reading a little bit of a, of a book that is related to, you know, the background of the story at night, you know, reading a few pages of that, maybe make a note or two or taking an entire day and going to the library and, you know, scrounging for visual reference. Um, it's just, it's constant because this is a thing you're interested in, right? Yeah. You're interested in your project. Um, you're interested in the things that go into it. Um, what are you using? Some, sometimes you'll be a little less informed than you'd like, but well, you know. what what are you using to collect all this this research and reference? Uh, are you doing like a digital morgue? Is it a physical morgue? Morgue meaning like the old timey term for like drawers full of reference photography or images. Uh, I saw a great blog post about, again, a name I can't remember. <laughs> uh, she was describing her process of working on a project. She would get a big banker's box from uh, wherever you get boxes from, you know. Yeah. Like from like uh, Uline um, or like at like, like a <laughs> Pier Jersey, 1. This is the shape of a box. Oh, wow. See, everybody, shape, size, light, and color. We learned something today. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so so you get a box. Yeah, <laughs> get a box. Write the name of your project on the front. That was me writing on the front. Uh huh. Um, and then everything that goes in, or everything related to that project, goes into that box, and you always know where everything is. That's a great idea. That sounds great if you can be that organized. Mm -hmm. uh, good on you. I usually just keep notes in in a little uh, cheapy sketchbook that is big enough to accommodate a lot of writing. But mm -hmm. small enough that I can sort of tuck it away into my my backpack or my bag or wherever I'm going. Oh man, uh, that that is that is definitely one of the tensions that we cartoonists face. Like like picking a a backpack or shoulder bag is an, an angst ridden endeavor <laughs> because it's like, well, is this going to be too small for my d various sketchbooks and you know tablets and whatnot? Or is it going to be too large? I don't want everything to flop around in there. And then, and then, yeah, picking a sketchbook, like you go and you look at all the different moleskins or whatever they're called, uh, and oh my gosh, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible. Is this too small? Is this too big? So yeah, but I, I feel your pain on that one. Yeah, exactly. And, and digital stuff all just gets bookmarked or saved in a directory or, or something. It's all very rudimentary. Okay, so you're just saving it in a folder on your hard drive. Someplace. As much as I can, yeah. Okay, I didn't know if you did like the, the Jake Parker Pinterest thing. I do not. Um, Have you seen Jake, his Pinterest boards? No, but I used to follow Jake's. Jake had a. There was some way to do this where you could get an RSS feed of whatever Jake favorited on DeviantArt, uh -huh. which was uh, which returned similar results and is also very interesting. But no, no, no Pinterest, no Pinterest. Uh, okay, okay, like I the. Have, a couple I have tried it, but Pinterest seems really intrusive. Intrusive. Just for my personal taste. Intrusive how? What, what do you mean? <clears throat> um, I'm curious because P Pinterest is one of those things where it, it, I'm, I, I'm beginning to feel my age where I look at it. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, where are these images coming from? How are people finding these images? And, and you know, I mean, I get Jake's usage. Jake cracked it for me. Like, oh, okay, he's using it as like a personal... Uh, reference morgue. He's got boards mm -hmm. for everything he's interested in. Here's his mechs board. Here's his fantasy board, character design board. 
Um, but beyond that, I can't understand how it would affect my life in any positive way. I think, I think it makes, uh, makes sense if you've got uh, a lot of different machines or you need to be able to access it via the internet. But mm -hmm. I just keep all my stuff in one spot. It's a lot easier to save it in a directory and just flip through it with the arrow keys. And Okay, that makes sense. And and that's that's something I do as well. Like uh, okay, so like when you when you're picking reference, um, when you're doing your research, what are the various kinds of things you're grabbing? Are you grabbing just location shots? Are you grabbing clothing? Are you grabbing color reference? Where it's like this is a great sunset, and I need to rip that off for my story. <laughs> I definitely have a color inspiration <laughs> folder. Oh, uh, okay. I do keep I do not look at it nearly often enough. I don't look at any of my <laughs> often enough. <laughs> Um, sometimes, sometimes what I do, I, I remember on, uh, on, uh, Seeds of Good Fortune, what I did was go to, I pull, shh, don't tell Corbus, but I pull a lot of stuff from Corbus. You just type in keywords, uh, Corbus online, I believe it's a stock photo, um, research or stock photo library. Okay. You just type in what you want. I just grab it. I'll grab it. Um, put like six four of these images on a, a on a page print it out and start like tape that to the to the drawing board and, mm -hmm. um, but Im yeah image stuff just gets usually gets saved into a visual reference folder um, if I'm reading stuff I, I'll be again just like writing notes in in the sketchbook which is usually enough. If I write it down once, I can usually you can pull remember it that's a thing I need to pull from. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have to refer to it back again. But um, unless I write it down, yeah, it usually gets lost. Um, but uh, so, so capturing it, not just downloading it, but if it's, if it's good enough, it also gets cross-referenced in the sketchbook as well. Or the notebook. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, like some of my research has involved like looking through these um, surveys of Orientalist Western writing and stuff, and just writing down cool ideas about travelers at the time and and that sort of thing. And usually they're they're cool enough ideas that I can just remember to pull them back later. Um, uh, da, 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 sorry. Oh, I had something totally blanking. <laughs> That's okay. That's what I'm here for. Uh, have you ever? Have you? Another one that I've heard from some of uh, some people who spend a lot of time on Tumblr is they'll create a private Tumblr account and then because it, as we artists do, we tend to follow a lot of other artists who reshare a lot of other interesting things, and so then we can instantly reblog it to right. our reference Tumblr. I've played around with this. I always forget to go in and look at the reference Tumblr. Oh, yeah, Tumblr. yeah. I, I can see that. Um, John Classen has a beautiful reference Tumblr. Um, John Classen of I Want My Hat Back and Who Stole My Hat, mm -hmm. I believe. Unless I've got those names mistaken. Um, yeah, he's got a, he has a beautiful, I don't know if it's a reference Tumblr or if it's just a Things I Like Tumblr. I think it's johnclassen2.tumblr.com. Again, could be mistaken. Um but yeah, just beautiful, moody, limited palette, atmospheric sort of images and some funny stuff. And it's, it's all very quirky. And when you look at it, it's got one of those themes where it tiles them all out, sort of like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it tiles them all out and, and it makes for a very, a very impressive little presentation. I don't know. Yeah, well, it makes it easier to browse too, right? Yeah. right? Rather than just like a, a solid stream of things, right? Uh, and it is John Classen, J O N K L A S S E N 2.tumblr.com. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, well, be, we're going to get into book recommendations in a minute here. See, these hours go by so darn fast. Uh, but I want to give people one more reason to visit your Tumblr uh, because you post really interesting stuff there. And this is an older post. What is this from? This is from uh, last right, November. Right, right. Uh, the importance of being important. and So, Jersey, last time I was on, uh, and we are talking with the brothers, yes. I believe. Yes, the Houghton brothers. Um, and I mentioned, uh, I do not want to have to pronounce his name. I know, La uh, Lajos Egri. Yes, yes, his La book. Yes, uh, The Art of Dramatic comes, Writing. This comes straight from that. And what I loved about this is that it, it sort of, it's not an apology. 
it's it's a statement of of course we all want to be important. Uh, that's why we interact with the world is we want to be important and noticed. And he tells a story. Do you remember it? Uh, I do. I'm actually trying to find it right now, and I'm having. It's on, do you know what the date is on it? I don't. I can pull it up, um, and I could even do a dramatic reading from it if we really want to. It is. <laughs> it is from uh, the fifth of November, 2012. So it's almost a year ago. Why can't I find that? And uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, you said you, you you mentioned a friend on Facebook says to you creative types. How honest are we with ah, with uh, being with ourselves when we say that we do what we do for the love of the thing, or simply because we have to a compulsion, and don't know how to do anything else? Are we just saying that we think? Uh, are we saying what we think others expect to hear? How much does the fantasy of one day achieving fame, glory, and a decent living play into it? Right. And you brought up this 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 forward from the art of dramatic writing, which kind of. Uh, sort of explains it and makes no apologies for it. So I wonder if you could respond to that a little bit, because I thought it was great. Yeah, it's... Uh, oh, I'm just quickly trying to browse through this and see if, see if I can summarize it. Um, Is it wrong to want to be noticed for my efforts, Tony? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Do you, uh, is that a feeling you get? Like that... Um, <clears throat> or is that a Canadian thing? <laughs> Well, Michigan is kind of like almost Canada. Like, <laughs> uh, so we, we share a little bit of DNA with you guys in some ways. But, uh, but you know, I mean, there's – humility is a funny thing. It's a, it's a difficult line to walk, and it's really easy to go too far, right? So, like, before we started recording today, uh, you asked me about that He-Man piece that I posted on my blog recently. And my first response – was, oh, that silly He-Man thing I did? <laughs> I'm proud of the darn thing. I wanted people to share it around, but when somebody asked me about it, I'm like, that silly little He-Man thing I did? Yeah. Now, is that false modesty? Is that me just saying, you know, right? You are definitely minimizing because it, yeah. does, it is uh, silly as objective, but it is not little. There's definitely a lot of work that has gone in there. Right. So... Uh, I don't personally think it's silly. But <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think He-Man looks great. I think that is a great He-Man design. I thank you for that. But I don't want to I don't want to get too far from the point here is this idea of, you know, like is it wrong to want people so, to notice your stuff? Right. So the the story in this foreword is is about a man who goes around at night um basically desecrating statues of the gods and this is in ancient Greece. Uh desecrating statues of the gods. He's eventually caught um uh, what is, I don't know, they bring him before uh, what, like a magistrate or something. Um, the magistrate asks him, do you know what fates await you? And he says, yes, death. He says, aren't you afraid to die? Yes, I am. Then why did you commit a crime which you knew was punishable by death? And then the man uh, it says here, the man swallowed hard and then answered, I'm a nobody. All my life I've been a nobody. I've never done anything to distinguish myself, and I knew I never would. I want to do something that would make people notice me and remember me. After a moment's silence, he added, only those people who die are forgotten. I feel death is a small price to pay for immortality. <laughs> um, so this, you know, like, is that what we're all trying to do? Like just sort of, you know. I got a book out there now. You know. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it, it, pfft, will it outlive me? Yeah, I'm, there are a lot of other books out there, so um, True. I've got no illusions that uh, you know be raised on a plinth somewhere. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's a, like it's a it's a little bit of my work that's out there now and will live on, presume independent of whatever happens to me. But uh, but is it as simple as that though? Too, I mean, is it as simple as saying like we do it for the attention that we might hopefully get? I mean, because that can't be enough to keep you going with all the five years that you put into that book. Um, I would ideally like to say no. Of course, that's not it. I mean, that that's the ideal answer. Yeah. Um. And admittedly, yes, to spend a lot of time on something has to be something you enjoy. Of course, I'm looking at the, the schedule for uh, potentially producing another book. And, oh, it will require X number of hours over X number of days over, you know, a year and, and 
I think 15, 15 months or so. Oh um, is that something you want to spend all of that time doing? And I, I, I'll admit there are definitely par- par- parts of it that are less than amusing, but, uh, <laughs> but gen- generally I, I enjoy most of it. So, so there is that. It is a fun way to spend your time. Fun, uh, rewarding way rewarding. to spend your time. That's a nice uh, way to put it. So, but yeah, going back to that forward, I, I think, you know, I certainly can't argue with it. Would would more of us be better off if we admitted to it, if we copped to that? Um, yes. I, I don't think it's something you need to feel like you, you have to admit to. I think it's... It's probably a part of it to a greater or lesser degree for everyone, and you just sort of embrace that and accept that that's a part of it, and you know, continue on. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't change anything, you, uh, anything about the way you do it. So just just uh, embrace it, own it, and get back to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that the, is that the yeah. Tony Cliff prescription? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> All of my prescriptions involve y- yeah, g- good stuff. Move on. Cool story, bro. Get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, let's move on. Let's get to book <laughs> recommendations. Uh, so, Tony, I don't know if you had any books that you wanted to recommend this episode, but if you didn't, I'll give you a chance to think about some that you might because uh, we got Rachel Moyer back I in the studio. One. Oh, cool. All right, well, first we're going to hear from our um, AADL PLA. PLA, what does that even mean? PLA. <laughs> uh, Public Library Associate, I think. I don't even know. Isn't that sad? Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm so, the acronyms are so ingrained, but I, I basically am just here to learn at the feet of the masters sort of thing. So you're like, you're like uh, an apprentice. Pretty much. Yep. Okay. D- d- just getting thrown in and then suddenly uh, Sharon Iverson and Aaron Helmerich said, guess what? You're doing the Comics are Great show now, whether you like it or not. Hello. Yeah. I was uh, sitting desk with Sharon one day and just got into a conversation about comics and it just kind of spiraled from there, which it's a good spiral, but it was <laughs> a pretty intense spiral there. Well, I should say you are not somebody who was like comics. What? Because mm. no, no, you, are, <laughs> you you know a lot about your comics. Oh, it's it's a lifelong obsession. So Yeah. So, okay. So what did you bring for us to, to read today? All right. Well, I have four books with me, and the first one is super self-indulgent. So, um, no, please. <laughs> I was hoping that you'd bring it because I want to hear you talk about Superman because yes, few people um, love Superman the way you do. Jersey can attest to this. I will take any opportunity to talk about how much I love Superman, and especially how much I love this book, which is Superman Birthright, which is almost a perfect origin story, if you ask me. Um, but wait a minute. This this was done in the last five years. <laughs> So it can't be a perfect origin story. The perfect oh, one was done it, 50, no, no, 60 no, no, years ago. No, no, Why no. is this perfect? It's perfect because it melds um, a lot of the really great aspects of the Superman story from the past 75 plus years into one really well-paced, well-told yarn from Mark Wade. And okay, it's got a really great Lois Lane. So that's <laughs> a huge thing for me. I'm a fan. It happens. Right. But um, the other reason I wanted to bring in this book is, you know, we had the blockbuster man of steel come out this what two months ago did Which, you like I'm it a, i'm of mixed feelings okay uh, I was we won't wondering. get into that that's, yeah that's, that's for another discussion for another time but but yeah part of the reason i wanted to bring this book in uh as my superman choice is it compared to man of steel it, it kind of uh, it hits that sweet spot i think people that didn't like man of steel would love it and people who love man of steel would love it because it um man of steel does take certain plot points and certain um feelings uh themes from the book but it also explores them in a di- much different way which shouldn't be surprising if you follow mark wade on social media at all you know he hated the movie yeah. he wrote this so <laughs> <laughs> he apparently he stood up and said all right i'm out <laughs> yeah so <laughs> so yeah if you're looking to get into superheroes or superman in particular it is a fantastic place to start and it's self-contained it's an origin story it's a little different origin story than maybe you've seen with Superman. It's a little more um, serious, probably, mm. um, but serious without losing the heart of Superman. Like it's it's about overcoming fear and showing people that fear is not what drives you. So I've I have read some of your rants about how the <laughs> oh, proper dear. treatment of Superman. No, and I and I tend <laughs> to agree with you. I mean, I, usually I jump in and go yes, yes, and this. Uh, so I am willing to 
take a leap of faith and read this just on your recommendation alone because if there's somebody who really, I think, understands what the beating heart of Superman is, there's two people, Dan Mishkin, well, three, Dan Mishkin, Dean Tripp, and you would be like the, the, the tri- tri- triumvirate is, of, of judgment of whether or not this is a proper Superman story. That is so. a huge compliment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Superman Birthright, what else do you have? Gunner well, Craig Court. Yes, I know Gunner Craig Court has uh, actually been mentioned on the show before. I'm pretty sure Sharon mentioned it, but mm-hmm. volume form, just uh, four, form, uh, mm-hmm. just came out this path past month so i wanted to recommend it again if you have not seen the prior show where it was mentioned last um it's a science fantasy story Mm -hmm. uh, about some girls that go to the school called gunner creek court which is a very high-tech sort of strange place with all sorts of um mythical and supernatural creatures running around and it's an interesting dichotomy because you've got the two main characters. Who there's Antimony, who's more of like the magic and the forest, and then you have Cat, who is all about the science and the robots and everything about it. Is there's like the sort of duality which is going on, and it's gorgeous. Um, it's actually a web comic. It updates three days a week, so if you want to get caught up before grabbing volume four, you can go to GunnerCreekCourt.com or you can get the volumes at the library. We do have them here. But the art is really nice, lovely colors, very pretty, lots of good expressions, and this particular volume uh, really goes into characterization of um, Cat, which is not the main character. The main character is Antimony Carver, but her best friend really gets a lot of development in this volume, as well as the mythology with Coyote and um, some of the other creatures of the forest. So it's a good read, definitely something to look at. All right. GunnerCrigCourt.com. And then you've got Jen Wang's work there. Yes. I, Jen Wang is awesome. Yes. Yes, she is. And Talk about good character design. The way her characters flow and move and those 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 inky, or the, 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 the how would you get, silky lines that oh, she yeah. uses Everything on her characters. Everything about this, the art in this book is dynamic. Uh, yep. There's just, even when they're standing still, there's just movement in the way she draws faces and... Oh, the book is Coco Be Good, I yes, should say. Yes, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I stepped part. all over you. I stepped all but, over you. Um, so what did you, what did you earmark there? Oh, let's see, lots of things. But um, <laughs> it's got a really nice limited color palette here. It's, it's a couple years old, so mm-hmm. maybe it's flown under some people's radar, but it's definitely worth checking out. It's um, a slice of life story about, um, I guess knowing what it is to be a good person and what you're willing to give up to be a good person. Like, does being a good person mean you have to fly halfway across the world and teach orphans or sell everything you own? Or does it mean just being a good friend? And do you have to give up everything that makes you you to be that kind of person? So... It's that a, goes back to what Tony and I were just talking about, like getting mm-hmm. to like what is the essence of the, of the story, idea, and the characters within, right, Tony? Mm-hmm. What you just did. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Nicely done. That was a good book talk. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, I still have one more to go here, and this I have mentioned a few times, I think. To good dog. People around, but um, Good Dog by Graham Chaffee, and I think he's been out of the game for a little while. He did some stuff in the 90s, but um, this is the first book he's come out with in a while. It's a black and white story. It's about a stray dog named Ivan, and he is just trying to find his place and, you know, his purpose. Um, he falls in with a pack of stray dogs, and it's um. Who put that out? That's that's a really. It's a fan of graphics. It's a. Oh, okay. Really well, that explains <laughs> it. It's a really yeah. beautiful treatment. Nice hardcover. Um, it's um, it's a pretty short story. It's a pretty simple story, but I, I think it's pretty powerful. Um, it's not. I know something. Oh, talking dogs. You're gonna think. Oh, maybe give this a kid. There is some swearing, so I want to just throw out that disclaimer. Well, it's fanographics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone realizes what th- that fanographics means that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. no, it's a really nice story. I, I gave it to my dog-loving sister and she cried. Uh, I really think it's something that would appeal to people that like, you know, Leica or oh, Watership yeah. Down. It yeah. is a little bit um, less relentlessly depressing than Leica. <laughs> Uh, I would I would call like uh, uh, well I guess it's not relentlessly bitter, depressing bitter but sweet. sad and it, sad it is uh, so sad yeah yeah I think let me put it this way I gave this book to my sister and she cried and then she thanked me I think if I gave her Leica she would cry and then punch me yeah so <laughs> if you don't cry when reading Leica go out and buy a soul right <laughs> right <laughs> but okay well I'll look forward to reading Good Dog too I have not seen that one before so mm-hmm. awesome thank you Rachel uh, no problem Tony 
Yeah, or yeah, you have any uh, books you would recommend to the readers? Or I viewers? do have three books. I'm going to bring two by quickly. Um, regular viewers will will recognize this book. Yep. Um, Astronaut Academy <laughs> Reentry. Pick that up in San Diego finally and charm the pants off me. <laughs> uh, this is Lucy Nisley's Relish. Have you guys been over this yet? Uh, um, it's been mentioned on the show before, but it, it, I don't mind when books get mentioned again because that's underlining. I think Shane right, really yeah, likes it, that book. If you want a really interesting reading experience um, or like a challenge, you pick this up, like let's say late at night, you start reading it, see how far you can get into it before you have to get up and get a bag of chips or make something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I feel very proud of myself. I got about halfway through before I was like, oh God, I'm starving. <laughs> I got up. Um, Is that the poll quote, <laughs> I dare you not to eat while reading this book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you just, mouth will be watering, you, stomach pangs. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> And this is uh, Luke Pearson's Hilda and the Bird Parade, um, which is, uh, you guys just mentioned, nice hardcover productions. Uh, yeah. This is one of those as well, but from Flying Eye Books. Um, I am not familiar with Luke's work, um, but this is uh, both a beautifully illustrated uh, book as well as um, having a nice central theme, central message that it doesn't, it doesn't nail you over the head with it. It's not. Um, it's not pounded into you, but it's also it also reads very clearly. Um, and some of the pacing in there is beautiful. His dialogue choices are really simple and really, really nicely done. Um, I I really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite books of the year. So. Oh wow! I would recommend Luke Pearson's uh, Hilda and the Bird Parade. Hilda that and looks the like Bird. That. <laughs> uh, Themes are a funny thing, you know. Uh, like you can you can use them as a scaffolding for the project. You can use it to just like you know build an idea or a story idea around it. Uh, you can use it to teach and to inculcate or to indoctrinate, or you can just leave it so that the readers can find it, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different ways. You this, can... this, yes, this book takes a nice nice sort of middle ground. Middle ground. You'll be able to find it, yeah. um, but it's uh, it, it's not. I don't know. It's it's integrated just really really nicely, perfect perfect for my taste. Okay, at least. Well, I enjoyed the Hilda and the Midnight Giant, so I know I will enjoy that as well. So okay, cool. Well, uh, gosh, that that brings us to the end of the show. So Tony, anything else? Okay, first of all, this is my book recommendation. Everybody, Delilah Dirk, DelilahDirk.com. <laughs> seriously, it is Tony. I mean, I, you're Canadian, so this is going to embarrass you, but you are seriously one of my favorite cartoonists of all time, and it pains me to say it because you we are so close in age. It's supposed to be somebody who is decades older than me <laughs> that I'm supposed to say I, that I about. I agree. I share your feeling. <laughs> I feel like yes, <laughs> but uh, it's 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 an amazing, so much fun to read, and it really, honest to God, took me back to the same feeling I had when I was in fifth grade watching Indiana Jones and the P Temple of Doom. It was that same exaltation of adventure and excitement, and uh, you know, strange places, and what could possibly, how could this possibly get any worse than this? But it never gets so bad that it's too scary. You know, it's just scary enough. Um, and anybody who's been listening to the show for a while knows that I watched Pacific Rim and did not enjoy it because I thought it was way too scary for my tastes. Uh, and everybody laughs and they, and they eh, I'm a sissy. Uh, but, uh, but Delilah Dirk is, has like it, an almost equal level of violence, yet it never scares because eh, Tony, Tony would argue with me on that point. Uh, there, there's, there's some on-screen death, on-panel death, uh, but it's handled in such, with such a light touch that uh, I think this would be perfectly appropriate for you know a, a nine to twelve year old, and I don't think it goes in any places that they wouldn't be able to deal with. So it's it's a perfect all ages book. Um, so everybody should go out and get it. And yeah, I hope it is. I hope it is engaging for young readers. I hope it's just a little bit ahead of where where uh, most of their stuff is reading is. Um, I was having a conversation about that with somebody, sort of um, about the level of readership it lands at and. And I was describing how, you know, like when I was growing up, uh, there was a lot of Calvin and Hobbes coming into my life. And I, there was one section. I don't want to take you guys too long. No. Um, yeah. There was one joke about Calvin wondering if Santa was a CIA spook. <laughs> uh, and I, did, I had no idea. I didn't know what, the, what a CIA meant. There were no dots in between the C and the I and the A. So it just said see a spook. See a spook. I had no idea what that meant. But you know what? You got to have those things in there. You got to. 
like work a little bit to try and figure it out. So. I, I I agree with that one hundred percent. And yeah, I mean, this is something. This is this is a drum I've been beating on for years. Is that you have to challenge them a little bit because one of the things that I scored really high on in my elementary school days was vocabulary tests. Why? Mm. Because I was reading Stan Lee scripts where right. you you uh, you know Xanthippic uh, poltroon. <laughs> And, and the first thing I did was, like, are those magic words or are they real words? I got to look them up now. And so I was, my vocabulary was increasing, <laughs> right? Uh, so, yeah. The problem is you are using the Stan Lee dictionary. So, <laughs> also. Every, every entry was Excelsior. Yes, Excelsior. <laughs> yes, thank you. Excelsior, the Stan Lee dictionary. Get on it, publishers. I, there's got to be a Stan Lee dictionary. <laughs> But anyway, but thank you so much for making time to be on here again, Tony. This was a lot of fun. Oh, and seriously, my pleasure, my pleasure. Always, always love talking with you, and uh, best of luck with Delilah Dirk. I hope everybody goes out and gets a uh, copy for them and everybody in their family. And, uh, you know, comes out, if you're watching live, comes out uh, August 27th. So if you're listening after the fact, go out and get it. Uh, Rachel, thank you for coming oh, in with the great no book talks. Uh, anything going on at ADL that you want to make any noise about? Any events? Any comics related things? Any video game related things? You know, I can't pull anything off the top of my head, and I don't have my computer in here. So, uh, uh, on Oops. the job training next uh, time. That's, next that's, time, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's my young apprentice. Next time yes. you'll bring in the the events listings as well. But no, that's Whoops. okay. People can go to comics.aadl.org or aadl.org for information on what's happening in our area. So, okay. And, Tony, uh, we can find you at DelilahDirk.com. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. At Tango Charlie on, uh, on Twitter, TonyCliff.tumblr.com on Tumblr's when it's working. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and, yeah, thank you very much for having me on again, Josie. Much appreciated. And thank you to Matt and Eric in the uh, control room for putting the show together every other week. We will be back in two weeks. We've got Ryan Estrada who's going to do uh, a great, great uh, discussion on why artists should, get, should not do spec work. And uh, I'm sure that will be a contentious discussion. Uh, and this episode will be archived at comicsgreat.com slash CAG83. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.